was Solomon's father. Continue under Solomon during the 40 years that he ruled as king of Israel, there was peace and unity throughout his vast domain. At the beginning of his reign, Solomon loved the God of Israel and coveted with God that he would walk in obedience throughout his administration as king of Israel. So Solomon made a promise to God that he would serve him and walk in his ways for the rest of his life. Somewhat what we've done now when we get saved. Solomon was promised wisdom, riches, honor, and a long life if he would continue in righteousness before the Lord. The promise was fulfilled during his life. Solomon became famous for his wisdom. <coughs> Excuse me. Great men and great women from many nations came to hear him and test his understanding and knowledge. Solomon also acquired great wealth and there were said to be no kings in all the earth who could compare to him. Under Solomon's reign, Israel reached her greatest point as a nation, honor, wealth, power, and respect were here because of the administration of her greatest king. He asked for wisdom and God gave him more than wisdom. He gave him everything. Can we mirror ourselves with Solomon today as Christians? It took wisdom for God to call us. It took wisdom for God to save us. It's taking wisdom for God to keep us. He promised us eternal life. If we continue to stay with God's wisdom, we will reap all the promises that God has for us. If we continue with his divine wisdom. Now I have a question today. <clears throat> can anybody give me, you, everybody can answer, not at the same time, but can anybody give me one of the promises that God gave to his people and gave to us? Nobody? Eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, let's start on the stuff down here, down on earth. What else? So you guys don't know you got joy? You guys don't know you got peace? Yeah. 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 All right, all right, I that's what I'm asking. Give me some yeah. of the promises that God promises gave us. Good health and prosperity if we do the right things. All right. Okay, that's some things from down here. Can somebody give me some stuff that God promised us in heaven? That he would never leave us. All right, somebody else. A mansion in heaven. All right, okay. Are we gonna be suffering in heaven? No. no. What are we gonna be doing in heaven? Living lovely. <laughs> oh, that's that's a good way to put it. Yes. Living, yes. Are we gonna have troubles? No. None. Are we gonna have pain? No. None. Are we gonna have sorrow? No. 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 Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Will there be anybody crying up there? No. 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 Those are Wait. the promises that God has given His people and to those that serve Him, and that's what He gave to Solomon. He gave him peace. He gave him wealth. 
He gave him wisdom. He gave Solomon so many things. And Solomon was grateful. God's word is filled with promises from our creator to provide and deliver. The Bible is the ultimate source for the truth and God, and God is faithful to fulfill all of his promises. In order to get God's promises, what do we have to do? Be obedient. Be obedient. Accept him as our Lord and Savior. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Both of those things are true. Freedom from addictions. And God is faithful to fulfill all his promises. Freedom from addictions. Deliverance from sin and evil. Financial provision. Hope for the lost. And hurting families and friends. Overcoming depression. Recovery, recovering a marriage, good health, healing, being free from fear and anxiety, strength, and many more are the blessings and the gifts that God promises to those who believe in him, who live in his wisdom. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. In Philippians 4 and 19, it says, he has promised to supply energy everybody needs, excuse me. He has promised to supply, can't even read my own read, writing. Everybody need we have, but God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. How much riches he got? He got enough for all of us? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. The earth is his footstool in his fullness thereof. He said, we cannot fathom, we cannot understand what's in store for him, for us that love him, that serve him, that obey him, that lives by the word of wisdom in his name. <clears throat> what about heaven? We said that. God has promised that his grace is sufficient for us. Second Corinthians 12 and nine. He finds us a way out of temptation. That's how much he loves us. It's wise to serve an all knowing and all wise and all on the, on the mission, whatever those words are. I'll just know the English one, but I thank God that he has all those things and that he's the wisest being in this whole world and outside of this world. And God's promises with the temptation, he finds a way. Just listen to that. He finds a way for us to escape. And that is second, first Corinthians 10 and 13. Sorry. The promises of God. They go on and on. I couldn't write them all down. I said, okay, I'll just stop at certain things because all through his word, there are promises. And those promises are for those who serve him in spirit and in truth and live by the word of wisdom. So far, I see it's wise to accept the wisdom of God. Now, Solomon was the king of Israel, and Solomon just had the most wonderful wisdom. There was one story in the word of God, and it spoke of two women that had two children. They had them three hours apart, or excuse me, three days apart, and they both came to Solomon, and the one, one woman she took her dead child, her child died, and she took her dead child and she put the dead child next to the sleeping woman with the live child and took the live child. So when they woke up, the woman that had the dead child knew it wasn't her child. 
So where did they go? They went to where the wisdom was with Solomon. And Solomon said, okay, what do these women want? And the one woman with the dead child that wasn't hers, she said, she said, we had children almost around the same time. And this woman child died and she put the baby next to me and took my child that was still alive. And I want my child. And, and Solomon said, the other woman said, oh, let's just split, split it and, and let the child die and let's divide it. And child Solomon said, bring me a sword. And he said, now cut the baby in half that's alive. And the mother that was the true mother to the live child said, don't kill the baby. I'd rather for her, the one with the dead, the live child now, I'd rather for her to have the baby that's alive than you to kill the baby. And Solomon said, she is the true mother. Now give her her child. His fame went all over the world. The queen of Sheba came to see Solomon and she was in awe of Solomon. She thought she would stump him and, and, and try to trick him, but you couldn't trick him. Why? Because Solomon had the blessed divine spirit of wisdom of God. It's just something about the spirit of wisdom that we as Christians must have in Jesus' name. So Solomon fame went throughout all the world. And he was a good judger of matters. He just had a life full of luxury. He was blessed. Solomon had everything. Do you know anybody like that? We don't have it now, but we're going to have it. When we see Jesus face to face, we're going to have it. He said that there's 12 gates to the city. And each gate are made of one large pearl and the streets are transparent gold. And there's a tree that's used for the healing of the nation. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. And that we won't rest day and night without saying holy, 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 Lord God almighty. And we shall never die, oh God. Stay in God, stay in his wisdom, oh God. In Jesus' name, let's find out what happens to King Solomon after he lived such a beautiful and richful life. In 1 Kings 11 and 1 reads, but Solomon loved many strange women. Here's the key word. Now Solomon from the beginning married an Egyptian princess because he wanted to. That was Solomon's first mistake because God told the children of Israel not to marry from certain groups of people. And Solomon married this Egyptian woman. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Zinakans, the Anhittites of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely, this is why God told them not to do it, for surely, they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So in other words, he did not listen. What's happening to Solomon's wisdom now? What will happen to our wisdom? Now, if we don't listen to God and obey his word and his commandments, our wisdom is dwindling away. We got to go back before the throne of grace and say, God, grant us your holy wisdom again. 
He says, acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he will direct thy path. That was one of my mother's favorite scriptures. Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come into you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And God says, he's a jealous God and he will not have anybody take his glory from him. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. That's a lot of people, a lot of wives. And his wives turned away his heart after all that God had did for Solomon. He allowed his wives, which were from other places. They were not Egyptian. I mean, they were not Israelites. God said at this time, don't marry them because they'll turn you towards other gods. And that's what happened to Solomon. Solomon lost his holy wisdom among other things. And his wife turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wife turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord, his God, as was the heart of David, his father. Now, mind you, David couldn't build the temple because God said his hands were too bloody. He had killed too much and he was a man of war. But God is saying that Solomon heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. So God said David's heart was perfect for, for in front of him. And he said David was a man after God's own heart. For Solomon went after Azareth the goddess of the Z Zidonians and after Milcon the admonition of the Ammonites, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as he did David, his father. Once again, Solomon's wisdom is now gone. I just want to know what happens to people that had God's wisdom and now they don't. Then did Solomon build a high place for Cherismos, Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. Likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Wouldn't you be? You give him all that? Wouldn't he be angry for us? With us if we turned around and left God and left whatever he's taught us, whatever he gave us? He gave us a, ch a second chance. He said, I'm married to the backslider. So like David, unlike Solomon, David repented of his sins. He knew how to repent and he repented fast. And God said he was after his own heart, a man after his own heart. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord, from the Lord God of Israel. which appeared unto him, not once, but he appeared unto him twice. 
And this is how he treated God. How do we as Christians treat God? Can you ask yourself that question? And he had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods. He told him from the get, don't go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. I can smell trouble now. Here it comes. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. What's going to happen to Solomon? Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, for as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee. You can put your name in the place of Solomon. I can put my name in the place of Solomon. I will surely run the kingdom from thee. I'm taking that kingdom from you. The kingdom I gave you, that you were blessed with, I'm taking it from you. And will give it to thy servant. Not even somebody that's already in the kingly manner, in the kingly way. Notwithstanding, in the days I will not do it for Daniel, for David, thy father's sake. Now, God does remember he made a promise to David. But I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. How be it, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but give one tribe to thy son for David, my servant's sake which I have chosen. Now, if you live right, and God had promised you promises, then there are certain things he's not going to do against you because he promised he would. And he loved David. And Solomon was David's son. But yet and still, he said, I'm not going to do that to you right now, but I'm going to do it to your son. And because of David, he said, how be it, I will not rend away all the kingdom, but give one tribe to thy son. For David, my servant's sake, which I have chosen, and for J Jerusalem's sake. And the Lord stirred up an adversary. Now you ain't, you're going to suffer because of your disbelief and because you, you left the wisdom of God. You're going to suffer now. Now God is raising up an enemy against them. He didn't have any enemies, at least none that he knew of. Nobody, there was no war. But now tables and tides are turned. And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon. Hey, Dad, the Edomite, he was the king's seed of Edom. So in the end, Solomon was left with foolishness instead of wisdom. He was left with enemies and not friends. He was left with a curse because he disobeyed God. And he didn't listen to God's commandments. Let us, as Christians, be careful that we don't wind up like Solomon. Now, some of you might be saying, that's terrible. After all God gave Solomon, he still disobeyed him and God took away his wisdom. But we can't look at Solomon. Earlier I said, put your name in the in that name, Solomon. Just like Adam and Eve represented all mankind, Solomon represented us. This can happen to us if we're not careful. This can happen to us if we leave the realm of wisdom. I want to keep my wisdom. How about you? 
Be careful that we don't wind up like Solomon. Let's look into our spiritual mirror one more time to see if we reflect the end of King Solomon's life. James 1 and 5 states, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not. And it's, it shall be given you. I'll take wisdom anytime. And I'm going back to the beginning. And it says, Hold on. Bear with me a minute. I have several pages. Okay, I'll read this last part again. Let him ask of God, whoever asks, needs wisdom, that lacks wisdom, that give it to all men liberally. And upbraid if not, and it shall be given him. I'll take wisdom. Go back to the first scripture, and it reads See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now, just give me a minute again. I'm on my second iPad. I'm taking questions if anybody wants to ask any questions. Okay. Solomon built the temple for God. I'm gonna read you about the daughter of Pharaoh because it was, it was so long for me to write in this book. Early in his reign, Solomon elected to marry the daughter of the Egyptian Pharaoh. Since Israel had imposed its over eight, its over eight, sorry, his sovereignty throughout the region, Solomon apparently considered it important to neutralize any hostility on the part of Egypt. For Egypt had been accustomed to using Canaan as a base for military operations. Marriages between royal families were often politically motivated. Such a marriage was on a way of signing a treaty between two countries. Nevertheless, the marriage of Solomon to the daughter of Pharaoh showed the lack of faith in the Lord who had promised to defend Israel and fight her battles. This is in Deuteronomy 20 and four and in Joshua 23 and 10. Later this marriage, and other marriages to foreign wives proved to be a major factor in the downfall of Israel. For Solomon began worshiping the false gods of these other nations and was condemned by the Lord. Through Solomon's remarkable building projects came, became world famous. I'm just reading you some of the things that Solomon did. They created serious problems in his own kingdom. He taxed the people heavily and used forced labor to complete his massive projects. The people began to complain and a deep resentment, especially in the Northern tribes began to fester. Am I out of time? I, I don't have the clock in front of me. Can anybody tell me if I'm out of time or not? You got a few more minutes. Okay. The life of the common man had been disrupted in the past of man's wealth and had been calculated mostly by the land he owned. The number of flocks he had and the size of his family. Solomon's sweeping economic changes altered that system. Land was no longer of supreme importance. In fact, it may have become somewhat of a burden. The more land a man owned, the more crops he could grow. And thus, the more he would have to turn over 
to the king's officers when collection time came around every 12 months. These are the people with the land in the kingdom. Likewise, flocks were surrendered to tax collectors. This is what's happening while Solomon is being swayed by his wives. Things are changing for the people now. Likewise, flocks were surrendered to tax collectors and sons were for forced to serve one month of every three in the king's labor force. Now wealth was calculated not by property ownership, but by the amount of money a man controlled. Now wealth, I read that, I'm sorry. Certainly more and more money in gold and silver came into Israel every year, but every little, little of it ever filtered down to the average of the Israelite. Now the people are beginning to suffer because Solomon lost his wisdom. Who had to surrender so much of his livelihood to the king's coffers? Instead, the money was used to pay, <coughs> excuse me, growing international debts, salaries for the full-time government officials, commissions to merchants and artisans in the king's employ, temple and palace upkeep, and other expenses. For the first time in Israel's history, remember how blessed they were? For the first time, there began to be a distant difference between the rich and poor. The king and his household were rich. The common people were poor. In between were the salaried civil servants and the merchants and the artisans, many of whom had organized craft guilds by that time. Such class separation had not been known in Israel, where a shepherd boy like David could be anointed kings only 50 years earlier. I don't know about you, but I think I'll keep my wisdom back into the hands of the pastor. <laughs>